The primal act of fighting is one that since the dawn of time remains embedded in the very soul of humanity. That's it! He's got the chance! He did! He's out! He he has has done it! it! He did! It is all over! Blood spilled on the sands of ancient arenas to the back alley boxing rings of eras gone by. And now to those cold eight caged walls in which today's warriors do battle. Out of here. Oh! The grueling fight. Oh! oh! Head kick! Curling on it. Another year of veterans, prospects, showmen, and true champions, the UFC remains undisputed as the premier promotion of combat sports. If you'll allow me, I'll be your guide through every significant moment. And if, like me, you are a practitioner of the sport we love, you can check out the sponsor of today's video, White in Black. For high quality and aesthetic fight wear, click the link in the description and use code LEO30 for 30% off of your order. Changings of the guard, shock upsets, and dominant beatdowns. No stone will be left unturned. Without further ado, this is a history of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. 1993 would be the flashpoint year that would birth the modern sports precursor. The Ultimate Fighting Championship would be conceived, a one-off tournament to decide which martial art was truly the best. Spearheaded by businessman Art Davey to Horleon of the infamous Gracie BJJ clan, it was equally an opportunity for advertisement to put the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on the global map. So we, you know, we start talking about how can we make this thing on a large scale. He said, Horleon, we got to go large scale. We got to go television. Then I came back in his office and I sat down and I rubbed my hands. I said, Okay, now let me show you what we're going to do. I said it's pay-per-view. It's a tournament. It's an eight-man single elimination tournament. Start selecting the toughest, meanest, ugliest, heaviest most qualified people we could. I said, you're going to have one guy from jiu-jitsu. I said, it'll be one of the eight. It was eight men, eight walls, one winner. But it's no rules tagline would cement a reputation as a sport that reflected the barbaric side of humanity, one that would not be shaken for years to come. Please welcome our first competitor, Hoist Gracie. But if you watch Hoist, that foot, there's the takedown. That's exactly what Hoist wants. He's sharpshooter, he's mean, but he's still a stand-up fighter. He wasn't a grappler. Ah, it's, it's, this is a major part of fighting. People do not it's, understand it's that it's this over. is very it's strong. Over. That's, you gotta do a great the joke. It's over. It's over. The Gracie family representative had won. Even with the monstrous weight differences between him and his opponents, Hoist had used the art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to slay the mightiest of foes. Sporadic renditions of the tournament would then follow. Now hallmark names such as Ken Shamrock, Don Fry, and Tank Abbott all competing. The UFC 12 would mark another twist in the tale. An outside force aiming to destroy everything that had been built. John McCain had come out with this whole thing. McCain came out and said, you can't put on these unregulated fights. There was no referee. There was nothing. It was terrible. What it was at the beginning was human cockfighting. It was. Everybody goes, well, what are you, crazy? And you know, what is that? It's human cockfighting, but it's not. It's like once you get that stigma, once you get get that name associated with you, it's all anybody associated with, with the brand or with the business. Senator John McCain would view the UFC not as an emerging sport with growing potential, rather a pessimistic outlook through an archaic lens. The term human cockfighting would be one parroted for years to come. Thanks to John McCain, he wrote letters to all 50 governors and it became banned in virtually every single state. Delivering a crushing blow to the company's prospects overnight. The, the marketing for this thing was, you know, two men out of the cage, one man leaves. and. He was telling the old owner, you can't do this. Referee John McCarthy would be one of the pioneers in turning a barbaric duel into a dignified and professional sport, adding mandatory gloves as well as rule limitations, the most of which we know today. Eye pokes, back of the head strikes, and of course the weird 12 to 6 elbow rule that still makes no sense whatsoever. Such a long-standing battle to claim legitimacy in the face of John McCain's actions had left the owners on the brink of bankruptcy, allowing three now familiar faces to swoop in and agree one of the most influential sporting deals in history. I found out that the UFC was in trouble. They were going bankrupt. So when I saw, saw this opportunity and I, I thought that uh, this thing might be for sale. So I called the brothers, they were in Miami, and uh, I said, I think this thing's in trouble. I think we could buy the UFC. Nobody believed in this thing, uh -huh. except for two guys, Frank and Lorenzo. I ended up calling back and just said, look, we'd be interested in doing the deal, but we want to buy the whole thing. And all of a sudden, we owned a business that we knew nothing about. You know what we bought? All we bought were those three letters, old wooden octagon, and 10 or 12 contracts. We bought a company that wasn't allowed on pay-per-view. Is on pay-per-view. With the Fatitas eventually securing sanctioning in Nevada, the UFC would return to cable pay-per-view under the watchful eye of new ownership at UFC 33. 
with now household names in Tito Ortiz and the Iceman Chuck Liddell all competing. Event by event, round by round, punch by punch, the UFC was shedding its old skin and garnering the reputation long desired. UFC 40 was the hallmark event that showcased the sport's true potential, perhaps not to the everyday American, but the founders and owners themselves. Selling out the arena with over 150,000 pay-per-view sales, at the time it was an astronomical success. Throughout the years, things were happening and everything always looked bleak. When I was standing in the octagon at UFC 40, I remember standing there before the Ortiz slash Shamrock fight and looking around. The energy of that fight, it was phenomenal. And for the first time, I honestly said, it's going to make it. Despite growing success in the face of adversity from almost every possible front, the bottom line of the financials told a bleak tale. 34 million in losses by late 2004, the UFC was on the brink of collapse once more and for the first time under its new ownership. We were burning cash. We end up getting to the point where we're $44 million in the hole and my partner Lorenzo calls me. I called Dana and I said, look, we're going to have to take a, tack take a loss on this thing. And I don't know why, but I, I got up the next morning and I just said to myself, I'm not ready to tap out. I'm not ready to give in. A shot in the dark was needed. One last attempt to save the company. And the rise of reality television in the early 2000s was the key. Up and coming MMA fighters living together before duking it out in a tournament for a six figure contract. Born from the minds of the Fatita brothers, the ultimate fighter was born. Let me bang, man. I don't wanna do that, man. Let me bang, bro. Do it, do it, do it. I can't let you get close. Can you hear my? Stop. Stop. Yeah, it looks like a orange cotton candy. Uh, you look like a 50 year old retired skateboarder. <laughs> the show, whilst entertaining in its first season, needed a blockbuster finish in order to secure another season on Spike TV. And two men, not from the high up offices behind desks, were the ones to secure it. It was fighters who would save the UFC for the first time ever on live cable television. Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin. Yes. We are anticipating on, a slugfest, it. and here we go. And these two crazy fucks are beating the shit out of each other. Feet, oh, uppercut just missed. Toe to toe they go. Oh, and a left feet yeah. battered, but neither can be beat. People are calling their friends like, bro, you gotta yeah, watch, you gotta this, watch shit. this shit. This it's is nuts. nuts. So you want to be an ultimate fighter? We ended up giving both guys a UFC contract that night, which made the place even go crazier. And we're gonna offer Stefan Bonner a six-figure contract with the UFC. The finale's success remains, at least as Dana White claims, the reason for the UFC's existence. And the second season of The Ultimate Fighter would be greenlit in the back of the arena on a crumpled napkin. Rapid growth began throughout the 2000s, and for the first time, the UFC truly looked to be going forwards rather than backwards. Stars such as the aforementioned Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell helped further crack wider demographics through their infamous rivalry. Their two legendary UFC bouts becoming the first early instances of quote-unquote characters in the UFC. Whilst the UFC's acquisition of regional promotions, the WEC, Way to bring to the and eventually Japanese promotion Pride, I told you, he picked him up and slid him to the he's out, he's I told you. would all reflect its growing success. With those acquisitions came a plethora of future stars. Dominic Cruz, Uriah Faber, the King of Rio, Jose Aldo, to name just a few. And on the UFC front, legends were being birthed. The spider Anderson Silva reinvented the term mixed martial artist with his own two fists. Matt Serra would be the better half of the greatest upset in UFC history by dethroning George St. Pierre. St. Pierre is over. It is over. Wow! And the prodigy BJ Penn would live up to his name by becoming a two-weight world champion. The sport was garnering legitimacy, though even in the late 2000s, it was still to have his detractors in the mainstream media, still branded with the scolding remarks once set by McCain years ago. It's sort of like human cockfighting, in my view, or uh, pit bull fighting. Guys are elbowing each other to the heads. Guys are kneeing each other. Um, they get into leg locks and start rolling around on the ground. Well, First I, 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 how is that human? How is that human cockfighting? You know what that is? That's actual fighting. You boxing guys, oh, it's human cockfighting. What you don't understand is your sport is getting swallowed. Even with its critics, it was clear now that through the careful hands of the Fatitas, Dana White, and everyone in between, the UFC was not slowing down. And with the 100th event on the horizon, a blockbuster card was needed. And one man would be the centerpiece of it all. Not a fighter by trade, but a WWE wrestler. Brock Lesnar! Can you see me now? 
Can you see me now? Alongside George St. Pierre putting on a clinic in the co-main, Dan Henderson lighting up the arena with his patented H-bomb, Lesnar would spearhead the main event by dispatching heavyweight champ Frank Mir and using his WWE panache to cultivate an iconic media moment. Frank Mir had a horseshoe up his ass. I pulled that some bitch out and I beat him over the head with it. Woo! I'm gonna sit out with my friends and family. And hell, I might even get on top of my wife tonight. See y'all later. To this day, the event remains the eighth highest selling pay-per-view in the company's history, creating yet another fracture in the mainstream media. Lesnar's polarizing influence had rubbed off on the sport massively. Chael P. Sonnen, of course, being one of many to earn opportunities through his skills on the mic. I don't promote fights. I pick fights. I'm better than John Jones. I'm better than John Combs. I am even better than John Holmes. John Holmes is a dead junkie, and Sean Combs is like a rapper. Is that the other guy? Don't bring up old business. Alongside his theatrics, which included an iconic rivalry with Anderson Silva, the UFC was expanding further than ever before into 2010. Is WEC merging with the UFC? Yes. The previously mentioned lighter-weight divisional stars were all to be absorbed, now fighting under one premier banner. The bantamweight, featherweight, and lightweight divisions were now open for business under those three letters. The following year, regional promotion Strike Force was purchased before being fully merged into the UFC by 2013. Its talent pool, including that of future champ Luke Rockhold and future Hall of Famer Daniel DC Cormier. 2011 would also mark the end of the UFC's broadcast deal with Spike TV, but the beginning of something far, far greater. I mean, we just couldn't be more tickled than to be able to announce this, this long-term relationship with the UFC. There's been a lot of big milestones that we've had over the last 10 years. In, in building this this company and, and, and growing the sport. But I have to be totally honest when I say that this is, this was it for me. This is what I always wanted. With the Fox deal came a new level of prestige inside and out of the cage. Now legendary fighters were making a name for themselves. John Jones's ascendancy to gold at just 23. Jose Aldo's unstoppable tenure as the featherweight king. And George Rush St. Pierre putting on a blockbuster event at UFC 129 in Canada. 2012 would also mark the opening of the UFC's flyweight division where inaugural champion and future GOAT Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson would remain for years to come. New horizons were being reached, global expansion with events held across almost every continent and country within them. But even with that, and its new home on Fox, the UFC had bigger expectations. Its perception as an archaic form of cruel entertainment was not yet shed, and changes were still to be made. Uh, when are we going to see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. Never? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Ronda Rousey would be the one to break that mold. Greatest in the world, and we haven't found a close second yet. It's not her ability just to go in and beat great fighters. She actually goes in and destroys them. Ronda wants to make it happen quickly. Yeah, she gave There's it the arm. It 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 I really knew that I was, like, seeing history. And still, Rowdy, Ronda, Not only was she the new breed as part of the first wave of women's fighters in the company, but she represented what a modern mixed martial artist was at the time. Movie cameos, brand deals, and talk show appearances had Rousey breaking the boundaries of not just the women's sport, but MMA entirely. Leaning into the heel role was one thing, but doing so with such a level of confidence matched only in the cage was integral to her success. A package deal of fighting ability and media savviness combined. Because <laughs> you do like a, what is it called, the arm bar? Oh, you have to give, it, give me your arm. I'll give you, I will, but I need a safe word. It doesn't take a lot of pressure, you just push it right at the elbow. Rumpy, rumpy, yeah. Uh, all right, all right, Rumpel <laughs> Delskin, right, The culmination of her efforts was a record-breaking event at UFC 193, with an attendance of over 56,000 tuning in to see her headline a pay-per-view. And although her downfall would come, as it does for every fighter, perhaps sooner than most. I feel like she's going to try and, like, keep distance and keep far away from me and get me frustrated and to yeah. a point I'll make a mistake and she can try and kick me in the head but it's not gonna go like that. Six title defenses ensured her legacy was set in stone for years to come. I, I, had, I did an interview with Ronda Rousey the other day too. Did she ask the woman? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, <laughs> off record. <laughs> off record. She was, <laughs> There's three cameras, bro. It's not off record. At the same time, Rousey was garnering huge success and making waves. Another man would not only usher in a new age for the sport, but forever cement his name with it. Enter the face of the fight game, the notorious Conor McGregor. The reigning, defending, 155 pound champion of the UFC, the
The rise of the Notorious was the perfect storm. For a company still stuck with its Just Bleed roots, McGregor was the man to turn the whole game on its head, and for better or worse, into the money business we know today. The Irish are back! I run New York City! I'm a fucking pimp! <laughs> Rocking guilty mink! And without me, this whole fucking ship sink! Before he'd even stepped foot in that octagon, Dana White had seen the dollar signs, and with the assistance of the Fatitas, would help cultivate the potential of the Irishman into a fighting god. And whilst Connor made his rise to fighting immortality, another god's blood was spilled on the octagon canvas. For the first time, and in 2,457 days since he first claimed the belt, the legend Anderson Silva would be defeated, finally the victim of his own flair and showmanship. Anderson. Oh! For McGregor, explosive wins against Marcus Brimage and Max Holloway would culminate in a headlining bout against Diego Brandao. Its significance marked further by a company return to Ireland for the first time in five years. The McGregor name is bled on the battlefield in the war-torn Scottish Highlands in the 17th century when we were fighting off the British. You now I believe my ancestors were doing that in them days. I am here doing that in the modern area, fighting on the modern gladiator stage in the UFC. <laughs> I said I was gonna put him away in the first round. I put him away in the first round. You said the fight at one point was louder than a rock concert. Is Conor McGregor a rock star? <laughs> People like him. His influence was undeniable. And even before his rise to the featherweight throne, many were already following in his footsteps. The age of verbal skirmishing had truly begun. People are always saying about the talk and I talk and I talk and I talk, but guess fucking what? I back it up, I back it up. 2014 would mark another historic moment in the UFC's growing history. The first of which, the long overdue decision to ban testosterone replacement therapy. Somewhat of an open secret of the UFC for years, it was a method used by many to gain physical advantages far, far beyond the norm. Do you think Hendrix was on something? Well, but, we've uh, talked about TRT Belfort. <coughs> TRT Vitor Belfort forever. Yeah, absolutely. Look looked like fucking <coughs> the Incredible Hulk. He had questions about you started testing you. I mean, what is your reaction? Is that just kind of more of what you've always heard? I've been dealing with that my entire life. I'm a white boy and I'm Jack. Deal with it. Along with the following partnership established with USADA the next year, once superstars who seemed immortal at times had begun to crumble and fold as their bodies returned to true form. The UFC was becoming a refined product, digestible to a wider audience bit by bit. Another step would be taken the same year, a controversial one at that. For the first time, official fight kits were to be worn by every fighter. From a casual perspective and for presentation purposes, it was the right move in the goal to pivot from its trashier roots towards a new era of professionalism. Reebok's initial tenure was rocky to say the least. Typos and a lack of quality in the product had led to numerous complaints. And for the fighters, it was another step backwards. The decision would mean no more sponsors and less money in their already bare pockets. Fighter pay remains to this day one of the most heated debates in the world of combat sports. While superstars in the boxing realm are showered in millions, even the goats of this game are underpaid, and the many fighting below them often live paycheck to paycheck. You put in all the costs, put on the costs of my family, the deductions and the loss of the fight tonight, I'm probably gonna have to rob someone in the car park, so. If anyone's got any money on him, who's, <laughs> who's got the most on him? <laughs> Despite the debate swelling into a lawsuit against the UFC themselves, the product of fighting inside those 8 cage walls will remain more popular than ever. Jose Aldo's unstoppable legacy remained intact, for now. New breed fighters like Luke Rockhold, Stipe Miocic were staking their claim, and John Jones' heated rivalry with Daniel Cormier would finally have its first chapter. <laughs> And of course, the Notorious would finally make his ascendancy to fighting godhood. Carrying the weight of a nation on his shoulders, physical and mental destructions over Dustin Poirier. Yeah, you ain't shit. This oh, conversation, looking to finish the fight. That's it, it it's all over. all over. Dennis Siva. That's it. That's it. That's it. And finally, Team Alpha Males Chad Mendes for interim gold would set up a unification bout against the King of Rio himself. No more injuries, no more roadblocks. Jose Aldo was to finally meet his greatest match yet. What you gonna do? You wanna do something? You wanna do something? You wanna do something? You wanna do something?
Brazilian bitch. One king gets old. He starts getting sloppy, he starts stagnating. Then a young gorilla comes up and kills him and takes everything he owns. Connor looks extremely loose. Smiling. Oh! He slapped him! Connor McGregor in the new UFC featherweight champion of the world! A new champion of the world, the Notorious! McGregor had near fully completed his transformation from humble contender to global superstar. But two more steps remained, the first of which, a dismantling of Eddie Alvarez psychologically and in the cage to claim yet another belt. Getting loose, getting better here in this round, though. Oh man, until that. Oh, he's done. He's wow. done. It is all over. History has been made. Conor McGregor is the UFC lightweight champion. What a performance. The sport's very first simultaneous double champ, the Irishman had elevated the game to new heights. So much so that the Fatitas would sense the opportunity to sell the company they had nurtured all this way. And in 2016, for four billion dollars, the seismic deal would be made. I, I didn't want to do it. The Fertitas were ready to get out. And they sat me down and said, listen, I'm done. But nobody will take it unless you stay. You had 9% of the UFC. You have 360 million dollars <laughs> plus whatever you had before that, correct? <laughs> I got a couple bucks. <laughs> Dana White would, of course, remain in the picture as the company's president, where he remains to date. And next for McGregor, a global step to tie the realms of combat sports together, fully cement his legacy and immortalize not just himself, but the entire sport of mixed martial arts into the mainstream. Billed as the biggest fight in combat sports history, poster boy of both boxing and MMA clashing against each other inside the squared circle. Does this mic work? Well then, that mic. I want this entire arena to scream F the Mayweathers. One, two, three, F the Mayweathers. Although the referee would wave it off in the ninth, there was no real losers. The money fight ensured both men were paid enough for five lifetimes. And more importantly, the UFC was now immortalized as a legitimate product of the mainstream, for sure this time. Amidst McGregor's boxing tenure, another clear indicator of the company's pivot to entertainment came in the form of the signing of CM Punk, a WWE wrestler who would finally make his UFC debut in 2016. Whether it was to recapture the energy Brock Lesnar once brought, replicate the star power of the Notorious, or perhaps both, the decision was bold to say the least. But your wrestling days are over. You have decided to enter the octagon and fight mixed martial arts yeah. professionally. It was a gamble that wouldn't pay off, as at his age, well into his 30s and with minimal training compared to the fighters he was sharing the cage with, to call him a fish out of water was an understatement. Two well paid for losses in the octagon would be all she wrote, and it would be a move Dana would never replicate again. CM Punk, you know, suffered a tough loss tonight. Is that it for him as far as how many chances you're going to give him in the UFC? The, the guy's 39 years old. I love the guy. He's the nicest guy in the world. Um, we gave him two shots, you know, and he had a lot of heart tonight in this fight. And uh, yeah, I think you should call it a wrap. In the wake of McGregor's absence was a breeding ground of stars old and new. George St. Pierre would make a historic return to dethrone middleweight King Michael Bisping after four years out of the game. John Jones would put any doubts to rest with his rematch against Daniel Cormier. Time reaching John. And the Hawaiian Max Blessed Holloway would rise to featherweight glory against Jose Aldo. I got a lovely son at home. Baby, Rush, you got another gold one, baby. You got another gold belt. The hard work done to elevate the fight game to new heights would be reflected first with a new subsidiary, dubbed Dana White's Contender Series, a new platform for up and coming fighters to emerge on the big stage and earn a UFC contract in the process. Alumni included the now infamous Sean O'Malley. Oh, and former light heavyweight champ Jamal Hill. 
Like many things on the UFC's pristine surface, it appears to be a good idea. As Dana White says, for better or worse. Everybody acts like this is a fucking career. This isn't a career. This is not a career. This is an opportunity. But the swirling debate on fighter pay only became ever stronger once the contract for winners was revealed. 10k to show and 10k to win. Minus your taxes, coach payments and everything in between. Those people are putting their lives on the line with hardly a penny or cent to their name. Along with the Contender Series, the Performance Institute would be open the same year to showcase it, allowing fighters to hone their craft in a state-of-the-art training facility. 2018 would also mark the opening of the women's flyweight division, where after a turbulent beginning through the belt's vacation, the bullet Valentina Shevchenko would stake her claim and remain dominant for years to come. All of these metrics pointed to a new direction for the UFC under the Endeavor ownership, only proved further by the finalization of a broadcasting deal with ESPN in mid-2018. 300 million per year to showcase each and every fight on the biggest of stages. The UFC was leveling up. But with such a monumental deal came more events that the UFC was contractually obliged to put on, beginning a new age of growing fight fatigue in the eyes of the hardcores. Whilst that was an issue, no doubt, the return of the Notorious wasn't. A fuse lit due to antics at UFC 223, the building blocks for a blockbuster bout against then lightweight king Khabib Nurmagomedov were in motion. Oh, UFC star Conor McGregor now under arrest this morning after he was caught right there on video. <laughs> The police are looking for him. They're going to arrest him unless he turns himself in. He's in a lot of trouble. Connor had crossed the ethical boundaries without a shadow of a doubt. And whilst Dana and the top brass were seething on the surface, behind the eyes was nothing but dollar signs. The showman era ushered in three years ago by the Irishman was clear, but this was a step further, and one that would be replicated and pushed even more by fighters in the future. There was no going back. Just let me give him. I'm going to go like my last fight. Happy birthday. Like I, I don't drink. Why don't you drink? I don't drink. Why don't you drink? I never drink. I'll tell you some booze are parties. I never drink. You're mad backwards. Yeah, dead drink. when I get me hands on you, do you hear me? UFC 229, a historic event built up over months. A showdown that even until now has never been matched in terms of raw scale and pay-per-view sales. No more time for talk. With the world watching, scores were about to be settled. Wherever you are in the world tonight, one way or another, we will all witness a piece of UFC history. The King is back. Face right at time, no range at all. They're just sitting there punching, exchanging. Oh! Massive right from Nurmagomedov! They know what he wants to do. They can't stop. There's the choke. He's got it. It's under the net. There's the tap. Still undisputed. Khabib Nurmagomedov. No, 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 no. Whoa! No, no. And he's going right at Dylan Dennis. Mayhem. Oh, no. Total chaos here. It looks like UFC security has corralled Khabib Nurmagomedov. Hey, we need Metro right here. I was here. What time A controversial end to a fight with a controversial build-up. Unsurprising to say the least, but in hindsight only added to the legend. An event that changed the landscape of the sport forever. Going into 2019, the sport from a business perspective continued to move from strength to strength in the wake of 229. The Apex Center was opened adjacent to the Performance Institute, complete with his very own octagon, albeit five foot smaller than a conventional 30 foot cage. McGregor's showmanship and antics continue to leave a lasting fallout, with fighters leaning further into the entertainment aspect than ever before. The king of cringe, triple C. How we doing? Triple C, aka the king of cringe, Henry Cejudo would make history by becoming the latest simultaneous double champ before another event that would trigger a knock-on butterfly effect to change the game forever. Multiple sources telling him that the UFC and one championship, a trade. Okay. This is Johnson going to one championship, Ben Askren going to the UFC. The decision for a company first trade with one championship was bold. The greatest flyweight and potentially fighter ever, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, in some ways banished from the UFC in the wake of a fallout with the boss. His replacement? Undefeated wrestler, Funky Ben Askren. What about the Diaz brothers? Oh, they're too high. I don't think they even realize what's going on right now. <laughs> I think they smoke so much weed that they don't realize I'm calling them out. Already a household name for his antics on the microphone, the American lived up to his nickname, no doubt, and at first glance seemed to be a beneficial deal for the company. 
His fight with Robbie Lawler was a premonition of what was to come, though, with Ben beaten within the inch of his life before a controversial submission win. But it would be the longtime journeyman Jorge Gamebred Masvidal that would use Askren's name to catapult himself into the mainstream. Their matchup long anticipated through a fiery build, Masvidal was in his ascendancy, baptizing Darren Till and making a mockery of now champ Leon Edwards. I'm doing my interview, and this hooligan comes by saying some stuff. Let's talk about that opening sequence. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> If you, shut up. As I'm walking up to him, I got my hands behind my back to signal I'm, I'm not coming here for problems. You know, so I had to give him the three piece with the soda. <laughs> and then just glide out of there, you know. When it came to his matchup with Askren, I'm sure even the most out of the loop of you knew what came next. Again. The fight clock is brought to you by Mojo. Oh! Like when, when they asked him about the Ben Askren shot, was it necessary to punch him again on the ground? He goes, Maybe it was super necessary. Game Red would have his meteoric rise from mainstay journeyman to global superstar in a matter of months, with Askren the full guy. One fighter lost and erased, yes, in the most unexpected of fashions, a new star born. His efforts would result in the creation of the baddest mother ever title. Silver Strap, officially recognized as a belt by the UFC, but for all intensive purposes, was nothing more than a novelty piece. Gamebred's dance partner was none other than 209's Nate Diaz. Fitting adversary, no doubt. And if there were any doubts on whether the UFC were taking inspiration from the WWE, the choice to have The Rock put the belt around the winner's waist, put all of them to rest. Introducing the man who's going to put the belt on the fighters, ladies and gentlemen, The Rock! Masvidal would be the one who prevailed, making him the UFC's new golden goose as the year closed out. Kamara Usman's rivalry with the American patriot Colby Chaos Covington would officially be ignited in the last pay-per-view of the year, the first chapter of which being a hallmark classic. Actually, I got a question. Um, you know, honestly, first of all, congratulations on, a, on your performance. Um, but, you know, you're standing here and you're, you're kind of talking now. When did your balls drop? Because they the only thing you're drop. losing faster than your hairline your is that Power drop? Ranger belt. Fake 14, news. That's why your name is Party Fake News, man. No one me, cares about you. You're gonna realize Shut up. Shit gets Stop talking. Real. pay per views going out the window. You couldn't, you couldn't draw money with a green crayon and a white piece of paper. Good kick to the body by Colby. And a good left hand. Covington is landing some real good shots in these exchanges, man. Usman, the slightly more efficient striker. Covington has been busier. Oh, oh big oh. right towards the end of the round. I think I broke my jaw. Him trying to play. Oh. Fight as a champion. 2020 was surprising in many ways. Firstly, with the return of the Notorious after two years out of the game. Entering the cage in January to a raucous fanfare, even if his dance partner was a step down in fighting ability. Oh! Consensus GOAT John Jones would finally meet an equal for the first time, edging out a close decision against Dominic Reyes in a bout many had going the other way. It was an electric start to the year for the UFC's fans and top brass, but a seismic event loomed, one that was bigger than just fighting. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Today I am officially declaring a national emergency. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. COVID-19 had brought the world to a grinding halt. Businesses, small and large, were closing up shop as countries plunged into lockdown. With millions stuck inside at home, streets abandoned, entertainment was not only needed but practically required, and Dana White would take the bold decision of ensuring that even with a global pandemic, the UFC would keep its doors open by any means necessary. I have this philosophy, don't tell me no. Anything can be done. We went through COVID. Uh -huh. COVID was the hardest thing that I've ever done in my career. When we were going through COVID, it's like, they're testing in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. If they're testing, why can't we test here? There, there's an interview of me during COVID where I tell you, we have a fight coming up this Saturday. And the reporter asked me, where is it? 
I said, it's none of your business. It's on ESPN. That's where it is. Abu Dhabi was the key to it all. And Fight Island, the moniker of the UFC's next big venture. A safe haven for athletes to compete and earn their keep, all the whilst entertaining those stuck inside. It was a new era for the sport, an unexpected one, but the company, by all accounts, would adapt well. With the empty arenas a chilling contrast to the broiling crowds of years gone by, hearing every punch and kick be thrown offered a new angle. There were new records to be set, legacies to be made, and blood to be shed on the sands of Abu Dhabi. Live from the Etihad Arena on Fight Island, it's time! Deep breath, folks. The tension of a UFC main event, but there is just no time to rest when you're fighting this guy. Double-digit combinations. Now, Calvin Cater just landed a nice right hand up the yes. middle there. Just a second ago. Oh my goodness, look at the cut on Calvin Cater's forehead. We're gonna see him go down if he lands another one of those shots. Calvin Cater seems pretty sound of mind despite all the damage absorbed, but he will need a finish if he is gonna move into this division's top two. Like, I was like, he was gone at the end of the round. I was like, oh, this guy not walking off for the fifth round. There's no way. He's even listening to the commentary team. Max Holloway. Holloway! Holloway's hallmark classic performance against Calvin Cater was one of many through 2020 and 2021. The beginning of the end for Tony Ferguson, Dustin Poirier's iconic finish over Conor McGregor. Oh, oh big left from Poirier, now a right hand! Oh, he's hurt! as well as Khabib's final title defense and subsequent retirement with a blemishless record. Even with the drastic change in scenery, the fight game waits up for no man or woman, and the vicious cycle of violence would continue. Alongside the Far Island events in Abu Dhabi, the UFC would relocate partially to the Apex Center to host both pay-per-views and fight nights alike. But as always with mixed martial arts, there's two sides to every coin, and its gradual use was a point of growing contention within the community. The novelty of empty crowds and intimate fights had long worn off, the fans craved bloodshed, with the roar of 20,000 behind every punch. This couldn't be exemplified any more than in the sad end to the career of Daniel DC Cormier, pioneer of the game, simultaneous champ and countless defences of the throne, a man worthy of a heroic send-off, win or lose. And yet, his final chapter would be in front of empty seats as he lost the rubber match to heavyweight king Stipe Miocic. Um, you know, Joe, I'm not interested in fighting for anything but titles and... I don't imagine there's going to be a title in the future, so that'll be it for me. You know, I've had a long run. It's been great. I mean, I just fought my last fight for a heavyweight championship, and it was a pretty good fight. So It was a great fight. It was a great it's fight. Amazing. You've been a great champion, and you will, without a doubt, go down in history as one of the greatest combat sports athletes of all time. COVID year would also usher in a new era in the presentation front. Reebok's tenure as the official fight kit supplier would be up, replaced with the reputable brand Venom. An improvement aesthetically for sure but the forever bubbling discussion on a lack of sponsorships remained present. Eventually, the COVID floodgates would finally open, even if the Apex Center events remained. As the world gradually began opening up its doors once more, the UFC's dramatic return to form at UFC 261 in 2021 would be a fairy tale moment. Headlined by the Nigerian nightmare Kamara Usman and the sport's shiny new star Jorge Gamebred Masvidal, the card remains one of the most culturally significant to date. Rose Namajunas is in the blue. Jean Lee in the black and gold befitting a champion. She's got to be light on her feet. She's got to create a lot of angles. And Lee has landed several of those inside low kicks. Oh! Is, is, is stoic. The UFC was officially back in action. And for many, a now modern fan was the first time they could truly experience the Ultimate Fighting Championship at its very best. Stars charting their legacies before our very eyes. The Olive era of Charles de Bronx was one of those. People think of Oliveira as not being a monster because there's times that people have beaten him. Like Paul Felder smashed him and Cub Swanson KO'd him. Guys have beaten him, but he got better.
Alexander Volkanovsky's ascendancy to featherweight godhood was also gaining traction, and the last stylebender Israel Adesanya continued to seem invincible at middleweight, at least in the cage. I'll touch him enough times, I'll touch him enough times, and eventually he'll crumble like the Twin Towers. El Diamante Dustin Poirier would put all of the demons to rest in his trilogy with the Notorious, his result leaving McGregor with a broken foot that would keep him out of the game for the foreseeable future. With the ESPN deal now well into its fourth year, the contractual obligations the UFC were forced to fulfill were beginning to take their toll. With successfully becoming a global brand and sport, near fully shedded of its old skin, the UFC was now taking steps in the other direction a form of entertainment gradually alienating its core fan base. Skyrocketing pay-per-view prices had made it simply unaffordable to watch, whilst bloated fight cars with lackluster talent in a soulless apex center were beginning to grow stale. Lockdown and the months following had also led to a rise in illegal streams that millions of fans would turn to, forcing Dana to take action. The, the piracy, the online streamers, they, they want to come after you and, and yeah. give this thing away, so oh. any, reg any regret? No, it kind no, of made no, me no, stir no, the pot no. a little bit. I'm glad you asked me about that because, um, <laughs> We got one. We got him. We're watching this guy right now. All you have to do is turn it on on Saturday, and we got you, fucker. <laughs> His blissful unawareness to how big of a problem piracy was was funny, but in the picture, it told a bigger tale. All of these factors prove the UFC was a far cry from the old days of the game, which although looked back on by many through rose-tinted glasses, had an element of romanticism to it. A pure, unadulterated form of a sport now sanitized and clean. The pay-per-views in 2022, though, were as exciting as ever. As much as you want to criticize the UFC, it's the one thing they get right every time. When the stakes are the biggest, both fighters are all in with their chips, you know it's going to be fireworks. But for one, Francis Ngannou, his chips as the ruler of the heavyweight division were of a different kind. His story, an all too familiar one, of a fighter not being paid his worth and being brave enough to stand up to such an injustice. A fighter make promotion. Of course. Yeah, you know, like, yes, promotion do help. They do help each other, but fighter make promotion. Recently, they signed a huge deal with um, Crypto.com. That was a good deal for them. <laughs> he wasn't the first person to vocalize such an issue, nor will he be the last. But his continued efforts to campaign for his fellow fighters was enough to create a rift between himself and Dana White, even with the belt around his waist. And for that reason, his defense at UFC 270 in January for the first pay-per-view of the year was bigger than fighting. With one more contracted bout on his deal, a loss of the belt against Cyril Garn would mean any leverage and negotiation for a new contract would be shattered instantaneously. Essentially, his UFC career was on the line. For the first time, Dana White had been bested, telling by his decision to not wrap the belt around the champ's waist. Nagano had bet on himself for all the marbles and come out unscathed. But rightfully so for a man of his fighting caliber, unscathed would not be enough. And a lucrative deal with MMA promotion and PFL would be reached. A contract fit for a king, the predator would leave the UFC and as I'm sure you know, find huge monetary success in the world of boxing. Nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen, but what I do know for sure is that I'm gonna be out there hunting, hunting for that guy's head to take it off. So I can guarantee you that. Oh, Tyson Fury goes down. He's dropped him with a left hook. Round three, Fury is down. And what a reception for Francis Ngannou. Tyson Fury barely escapes <laughs> with a split decision win. In the grand scheme, it was a small dent in the UFC's impenetrable armor as the premier promotion marched on with no shortage of upsets, thrashings, and storylines. Kings were to be toppled, a new reigns begun. But whilst the UFC's explosion continued, the president, Dana White, had another race up his sleeve, perhaps his most controversial yet. Oh, oh my God! Whoa. Oh my God! Whoa. Oh, shot. Power slap. Whilst not necessarily linked to the world of MMA, Dana had used each and every social media resource to push it in front of the faces of every mixed martial arts fan. There's one thing to cultivate a sport with rules, referees, and commissions. There's another to do the very same, but at the crux of it all, athletes are not even allowed to defend themselves. Oh, oh my God. Low ratings from viewers in its initial season would result in its home moving to Rumble. Despite being universally panned, White's web of lies would only continue. We're number one in all of sports. And when I say all of sports, if you take the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, F1, WWE, 
and who am I forgetting, and added them all together, their numbers don't compare to slaps. Stop the cap. <laughs> It's an experiment, just like CM Punk in fighter form before it, that would fail. The fight front, of course, though, was why it's bread and butter. First matchup in UFC history of fighters with an unbeaten streak of 10 or more fights. Kamar Usman had hand surgery several months ago, was hoping to headline International Fight Week in July. The challenger Edwards in red, champion Usman in the black and gold for the UFC 278 headliner here tonight. Oh! oh look my at goodness. this! In the full mount. That is a takedown. First time Usman has been grounded in his UFC career. Wow. Oh, nice uppercut from the champion. Big shots from Usman. Level change for Usman. And he, he takes gets Edwards it. down. And he gets it. A dejected challenger. 20 yeah. minutes down, five to go. You got to empty the gas tank here. Yeah. He may have resigned himself to losing a decision. But that is not the cloth from which he is cut. I mean, no. that is a dejected. Oh! Oh! Just shook the world. Two decades of development into the European market had finally bore fruit. Dagestan and England both with their second UFC champions. Both matchups were filled with an air of respect, but everyone loves a rivalry. And in the fight game, it's the cultivation of an enthralling storyline weeks before a clash that keeps everyone invested. In that regard, Alex Poata and Pereira's pivot into the world of MMA was the beginning of something quite legendary. Spurred on by the call-out of once kickboxing rival turned middleweight king Israel Adesanya, the Brazilian would enter the UFC with a fierce resolve to surpass everyone in the shortest time possible. The UFC, of course, knew this too, and would push Poatan faster and further than anyone before him. And after just two wins in the UFC, a title eliminator against the polarizing Sean Strickland would be waiting. Stand and just kickbox with this guy. Oh! And as Izzy was on top of his throne, clutching the belt he had maintained for so long, he had perhaps not accounted for the intrinsic raw hunger that only brews in the quest for such an accolade. And that, combined with how closely they matched up skill for skill, was the factor for his downfall. All right, here we go, round one for the undisputed UFC middleweight championship. Behera just there's so much danger when he gets close to you. Oh, nice there's jab there by the challenger. Look at this. So it is Adesanya who ends up on top now. Axe kick to the body. And a lot of the action's taking place in a very short space. The big octagon seems to be favoring Adesanya right now. 20 down, five to go. Woo! Oh, com certeza eu achei que eu tava, tava perdendo. Vou falar uma coisa com você. Só no dia assim. Vamos, vamos, vamos. Até segundo eu preciso ser campeão mundial, Patão. Cinco minutos, Patão. Unlike many of the storylines that were ushered in and propelled through characters and fake personas, this one was forged through honor and respect. Two men at the top of their game, both chasing the same glories. And for that, it was a refreshing chapter, but not the final one in the book. Who's got the first question? What's at stake here for you? I mean, what does this fight mean to you? I say to you that we have to forget these three fights that passed. But the Adesanya will never forget these fights. What happens, what happens, he will never forget. Simply be the belt. I'm coming for his head. Here we go, boys. The hitter right away goes right back to that outside leg kick. Come a lot of success with this early. Beautiful body kick lands for Adesanya now. Israel Asadi just acknowledging his focus and the brevity of those five minutes. And Alex Pereira brewing with confidence after what he got done over those first 300 seconds. Oh, jab to the body and a right hand up top. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Again, oh. Pereira so oh, dangerous. My oh, counter right from oh. Asadi. Pereira oh. down and out. Oh, the star. He got him back. Israel. 
Many a times I've mentioned the gradual shift towards an era of showmanship, leaning into the entertainment aspect that the WWE had perfected for decades. It's gonna have to... Oh my goodness, no way. I can't believe it, it's so cold, Alex Volkanovsky. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> well, September of 2023 would mark the final nail in that coffin as the UFC would merge with them under one banner, dubbed TKO Holdings. A publicly traded company, it may well be the final form of the UFC. A company once bought with nothing but a dozen fighter contracts and a wooden octagon to its name, now a global superpower. 2023 was also an incredible year on the fight front. Featherweight King Volkanovski would attempt to live up to his nickname by challenging for lightweight gold against the still reigning Mahachev. And whilst both fights in which he would lose... His performances and the circumstances surrounding them were admirable, no doubt. John Jones would then return to the cage for the first time since his razor-close win over Dominic Reyes three years ago. Only this time it would be upper weight class, and as dominant as one can be over the French striker Cyril Garn. A first round guillotine choke to become a two-weight champ. And for all intents and purposes, the greatest of all time debate settled forever. Last thing. <laughs> Outside of the cage, however, it seemed that all roads would once again go through Conor McGregor as the notorious his absence following his last loss would see him leave the USADA pool entirely. Never admitted, but his body transformation resulting in this absurdity was telling of performance enhancement usage in aid of recovery. And once returning to competition, the standard rule set of six months waiting with two negative tests was to apply to the Irishman. Only Dana and co didn't exactly see it the same way. The resulting quote-unquote mistreatment of their top star would lead to a breakaway from USADA entirely the last bastion of third-party sporting integrity affiliated with the company. Whilst the new deal would be signed with drug-free Sport International, it remains to be seen how effective such a move will be. Sean O'Malley would then complete his ascendancy in August, seven years since his Contender Series appearance, solidifying the star power he always knew he had within him. Sean O'Malley's first UFC Championship opportunity has arrived against the champ Aljamain Sterling. Aljamain on the pressure right away trying to make Sean throw something so he could level change. O'Malley attacks the body there. O'Malley feints at you to try to draw out reactions. First takedown attempt of sorts comes late in the round for Sterling. All right, both corners largely like the work out of their guys in round one. Earlier leg attack for Aljamain Sterling here. What it might be like early round two. Sterling on the... Oh! Fighting English would have their voices heard once more, with welterweight king Leon Edwards dispatching Colby Covington over 25 minutes. And a no doubt future heavyweight great Tom Aspinall would claim interim gold whilst Jones would wait in the wings. But as we fight through 2024, with the run-up to a historic UFC 300, it's fair to say that the company has come a long way since its humble beginnings as a blood sport, to now a product enjoyed and endorsed by millions. Yes, there are controversies, ups and downs, but inside the cage, the cycle of the fight game continues. Veterans of the game fade out like dying embers in a harsh winter, whilst the new up-and-comers seek the same accolades once held. And for the small minority who are successful in their endeavors... Careful. Oh! Israel Adesanya is the undisputed king of the middleweights! ...likely doomed to repeat the same legends that preceded them. The highs and the lows, the rises and falls. And as fans, the best part is, we get to be along for the ride for every single moment. Hi, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching this video. It took me a stupid amount of time to make and is by far the biggest and best project I've ever worked on. So all I ask is that you maybe hit the like button or perhaps even subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. I've got a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline for the channel this year. And if you don't tune into my live streams on Tuesdays and Sundays, this might be the first time you see me on camera, but you can check them out every week whenever you feel like it. If you perhaps want to talk about MMA or everything in between, the Patreon is in the description if you want to help support the channel. It means the absolute world. And you can get your name at the end of the video, just like Ivan here. So thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.